Okay, so let's get formally started. So welcome to IT Services Management for this year. So we've just been talking a little bit about you know, this sort of context, the fact that actually IT is not the mo most robust environment, that apps particularly are in a permanent sense of beta testing, we're doing all the testing basically for most of the app developers. If you look at operating systems, particularly uh, the one I just mentioned, we, the users, are the developers, or at least testers. And if you think about Windows 10, if you are incredibly lucky, and it's a very modern PC, you may well get a good experience. So I was talking to the third year a couple of days ago, and two of them a bit upgraded because, you know, they thought, oh, it's the latest, latest, newest thing, and I want to get back to the Windows 7 Classic type of interface and so on. don't like all this Metro uh, tiles and so on, which are difficult to use. And some of them had a great experience, totally clean and painless. And I mean, Dave Voorhees, he, he upgraded one of his PCs, no problem. But two of the students, I wouldn't say the machine was trashed, but they couldn't use camera, they couldn't use this, they couldn't use that. So the answer for <coughs> operating systems tends to be wait until service pack one or perhaps even service pack two. Now how many of you have got iPhones at the moment? Only one iPhone? Two. H have you upgraded to iOS 9 yet? Did it work? Yeah. Okay. I get thinking back to was it iOS 8 or 8.1 or 8.2, and it, they got an awful lot of bricks around the world. So I'm kind of thinking, do I upgrade or do I just ignore it for another little while, wait till it be verified in the sense all when 8.1 uh, comes out. Probably wise to do that myself. And so I can't <laughs> upgrade to Windows 10 until Service Pack 1 comes out. So we have this problem, a permanent beta test, we the users do much of the testing for organizations, and it doesn't matter whether it's stuff on, the, on these PCs, <coughs> or enterprise level quality systems, whatever, we are still doing an awful lot of bug hunting. And what IC Services Management is all about is really thinking about some of these issues that make life really difficult for us and, our, and for the users of the software that we design and implement. And send out places. <coughs> what we did last year was, as the assignment, was to look at a, a typical kind of IT service provided here in the University of Derby um, that was used by you guys as students, so you had experience of it, to do a criti critical evaluation of that service and then come up with an improved version thereof. And it could have been a service that was just done by hand, or paper, or something, or it could have been one that was already there as an electronic service. But you were then to, they were then required to design, in, or at least in principle design, uh, a new service that would be of value to students. Now, this year we're going to move outside of the university to look at some of the other services out there, apps provided perhaps through smart devices or PCs on through the web or whatever. So you're going to, you're going to see in a week, a week or so's time the published articles for the last two years, which relate to university type services. Um, but this year we're going to move ourselves away from that into the more publicly available services that you use through your smart devices. And come up with ideas for making them better and justifying you know, that kind of approach as to why it's not very good and why it needs to be improved. And it actually runs parallel with your, one of your other modules you're doing this semester with Dennis, IT Product Development. Have you started that yet? Yeah. When, which day of the week do you do that? Monday. Monday, so you've got four days between the two um, modules to see. He tells you, or helps you to learn how to go about designing good products. I'm teaching you about how you think about the broader perspective of the service that that Thing does for you and linking them all together is databases that's where the data lives 
now because you're all doing databases this year, term, aren't you? Which yeah. day do you do that for? Tuesday and today, but we haven't got one. So. Which, when about today? You have a tutorial? Oh, we usually have a tutorial after this, but we haven't sorted out yet. Okay, right, so you have a tutorial after this. So the, between the three modules, <coughs> you're really looking at the beginning, the middle, and the end point, or, and the overall perspective. So IT services management, in one sense, <coughs> should actually come first because this is sort of looking from quite a high level what should we be doing? Then it leads into product design. Well, if we want to do that and achieve that and deliver those benefits, then we start off designing it like that. And the product development design leads across, in principle at least, to this is the sort of data that we need, this is how we should store it, if we're going to achieve all of those things. And then if you go back to last semester with your SAS work, you know, you can see how you can actually join data together and get some interesting things. So that kind of sets the sort of background of where I think this module is placed and why it's going to be quite fun for you. <coughs> oh dear, someone has set up the uh, sleep time. Oh, I haven't even got an Ethernet. So are you all logged into the, the right place in the module, the course resources? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, we'll go to module info and look at the, the spe official specifications for it just so I can take you through what actually happened. Richard? Yeah? I'm going to transfer that password. Okay, right, do that. And as always, I like to take you through the module specification just so that you really understand where we're coming from, where we're going to end up. And it's not just the businesses which are dependent. You know, your generation is probably the most tech dependent generation the world has ever seen. You need, most of you, your iPhones or your smartphones, your tablets, your PCs, as high bandwidth internet connection as you could possibly get hold of, and so on and so forth. And the claim is that IT is required to run businesses efficiently, uh, effectively, and to ensure that it compete, can compete with its competitors. We may well end up critiquing that statement. In terms of definition, an IT service, in terms of to a business or to us as users, is a combination of technology or technologies, people, and services which may be physical, they may be anything, delivering information in one form or another. So fundamentally, we're starting off right at the top end. What is it? that's required? What is the fundamental question that 
needs to be answered. Both in terms of strategic direction, that is where we want to go, take the business over the next uh, period of time, for several years hopefully. <coughs> Maybe operational, keeping the business running today. I mean, if you think about the University of Derby, you've got access here to Blackboard, you also have access to your student records through something called PeopleSoft and so on. And they are providing you with the operational information, the stuff that you need to do the job today. The strategic stuff is how you position your business basically for the future. There are many, many different ways of looking at this top aspect of how do we position ourselves, how do we build, design and build our systems. And one of the ones we're going to look at is enterprise architecture. And that provides a really interesting framework. And when we get to that section uh, in a couple of weeks' time, I think it is, uh, you'll see, because we will use a Zachman architect, enterprise architecture, it starts at the very top of the organization answering questions that sort of the board of directors ought to be thinking about. And it then works all the way down to the sixth level where you've got the people who are coding. So it shows you how to think about all of the activities all of the relevant questions, all the way through from top to bottom. In terms of those useful things called learning outcomes, because they help you to understand what we're trying to help run, uh, learn, at the end of the module, you will be able to demonstrate an understanding of the role of IT services management, you know, the provision, end-to-end -end development, and so on. Thinking about what a service is in comparison with a thing called a product, and we'll develop those ideas in a little bit. And the impact of those different technologies on an organization. You will also be critically evaluating various options and different ways of satisfying that business need. And you'll be able to make appropriate, justified recommendations. And you should be able to design an IT service with multiple products and so on and te technologies to meet a defined business need that comes from that top level uh, definition. And we're concentrating very much on the critical analysis and justification of what you are doing. So those are three sort of things that you're going to be doing. And the difference between a service ultimately is what we're talking about in here. The product is what you learn on Monday in IT product design with uh, Dennis. These are some of the things that we will be touching on. These are eight or so bullet points. We may not cover all of them because they're not the things we necessarily have to do. If there are new and interesting things that pop out of the woodwork over the next 12 weeks, then we'll cover some of those as well. The point being that I want you to be working at the leading edge of what is happening today, not with what was happening when we wrote the module spec three, four years ago, um, or in textbooks 20 or 30 years ago. I want you right up at the front end. And a little bit like in Introduction to Computer Science last year, the assessment ultimately is an article that you will get published if it gets 65% or above. We'll e-publish it. One of you will volunteer to edit it all together, all the, uh, the assignments that get that. And past practice would suggest that about three quarters of all of you um, or more will get above 65%. That's the technical definition of the assessment at Course Act 1, a single component, a single item, uh, worth around about 3,500 words, and it will actually be in the form of a journal, a learned, researched journal article, uh, which will actually provide uh, 
guidance or analysis and guidance to organisations outside of the university, things that your research has actually uh, helped you to come up with and justify. And if, if you want to be fairly harshly critical of a particular service out there, as long as you can justify it, all the evidence that says why it ain't a good idea or why it's not working very well, great. Plus, appropriate, this is what needs to be done and why it needs to be done to make it really valuable, very, very usable. That's what the assignment's going to be about. And yes, here is the reading, the required reading list. Well, these are some books over the years which have had some interesting points uh, that are of interest and importance. Yes, they are typically relatively old. They're not leading edge today, the last two or three years. My justification for that is that they are, help you understand some <coughs> basic concepts around this whole thing which haven't changed in 40 years. We're working in an industry where the answer changes by the day, but the fundamental questions haven't changed in 40 or 50 years. I started working in the field in 1969, a year in industry, three years at university, and then from 1973, four onwards, I've been involved heavily in the in IT industry, uh, business. And the stuff these guys have to say is enduring. It's still relevant. Yes, I know that in that one, I think it is, there are some photos. That's the fourth edition, I think. Oh, no, sorry, not that one. Lower down. But there's one of those, I think, where there's some photos which are of modern electronic equipment or modern computers, which are photos of IBM mainframes from 1985, which is not what I would consider terribly modern. And I recognize the model numbers and I recognize the boxes in the black and white photos. Most, if not all, of these are in the library. That one is still in the library. That's a very interesting one. Um, I'll tell you why it's interesting sometime in the next few weeks. But, like I said last year, I think, but I'll repeat it this year, I am not going to teach you any answers. I'm only going to teach you questions. Why am I only going to teach questions? Pardon? Yeah, that's part of it. Now, what's important about leading to answers in today's environment? Well, you um, research yourself. Partly. Teaches you to think. Teaches you to think, yep, that's a good, good point. And you're here to learn how to think. But what else is important about not being given answers? The answers change, the questions don't. If I teach you an answer, it's relevant to one specific context and will not be relevant possibly even the day after in that same context. Certainly will not be relevant in another organisation. And I used to uh, teach a, two or three modules down in Southern Africa on a programme we ran out of Derby called MSE Strategic Management, mainly business. Uh, thing, a bit like a business, uh, MBA. And while I was down in places like Botswana, Southern, South Africa, Malawi, one of the points that came out very much from the people I was teaching who were mid-career, uh, middle-level managers or senior-level managers, they were finding it very irritating to keep getting consultants who came down and said, ah, oh, I did this, 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 and this in this industry, in your industry, in Europe or in one of the other countries in, in the area. And I know the answer to your company, the company's problem. And would dive in straight away and start trying to say, this is your problem, this is the answer that you need to do, rather than coming along and saying, look guys, I've got a lot of experience, but I don't know your business. I may know banking, but I don't know your bank. Because your bank 
lots of different things compared with that bank, both operating in Botswana or in Malawi, or one in Malawi, one in Botswana. The challenges, the business requirements, the issues, the services, <coughs> the technology is always going to be different. So the questions are the same, but the answer is incredibly different often. Or maybe only very subtly different, but that subtle difference may be enough to de derail a suitable solution. So questions, not answers. I'm going to be probably very pr uh, provocative at times. There's a fairly apparently outrageous statement, uh, but that's there to challenge you to start thinking about what is the real question? Where's the evidence? Because I want evidence in all the things that you write, all of the dis discussions we have. I want you to provide evidence of your position in the argument that you're developing. These will give you some ideas about the enduring quality of the questions, your actual research, which we'll be doing week by week, is what will actually help you find the real evidence for today in terms of individual types of problems that we're going to be looking at. So that's the module spec, so you know what's going on a bit. To help introduce you to the style that I, uh, materials I give you, I'm showing you this whole folder structure, which you can see. There's almost always in the modules I teach a folder at the top of, of the study materials called interesting resources. And there I will add in postings every now and then when I find something really interesting that will help you with new ideas or challenge the way you're thinking, challenge the way you've developed some of the work you've been doing. And you know, there's a lot of stuff there that's built up over the last two, three years. And I will add them at the top so you can see the newest stuff. And I'll always make an announcement as well. I'll email out that announcement to you guys um, so that you know that there's something new to look at. Sometimes I'll put it there. If it's <coughs> very, very enduring, I'll put it all there. If it's a file or folder, file or something, I'll put it there. If it's a, oh, just go and look at this URL, I'll probably just send out the announcement. And that's why you'll see in the announcements on here, a lot of quite old announcements which have URLs to interesting resources. Today, week one, we're going to be doing some sort of the basics around here. And then next week, we dive into um, a start where we'll be looking at two or three fairly interesting catastrophes over the last 15, 20 years. Um, maybe a little bit longer, that we can learn some lessons for about the design and implementation of IT-related services. And in fact, we'll cover that for, for two weeks, because there's a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of research I want you to do to get some, A, to learn some really good questions, and B, to use some of those to develop into some interesting answers and analysis. Then week four, we look at um, how services help to support business needs. And then in week five, we look at enterprise architectures and the Zachman architecture itself. Then we go move along the <coughs> to see who is involved, the customers at one end are gonna use it, and other stakeholders around it. And so think about what a stakeholder means, a person who has an interest in the thing under discussion. We'll then look at um, the question of what we call technology acceptance models, because we need to understand what are the factors that affect my or your or other people's inclinations to actually start using the services to start and actually continue using those apps and systems and so on. Um, ah, yeah, these are, I think these are greyed out probably. Let me switch it into screen mode so you can see, I can see what you can see. How 
how do we go about delivering um, our services? How do we measure the success of what we've delivered? Um, and then we'll pull things together. There'll be a week, and it may or it quite likely to be about week 11. Uh, there will be no lectures, no seminars, no tutorials, no nothing, other than you will come to my office to schedule I will publish and you'll give me your, what should be your final, final draft of your assignment. And we will go through it together for about 10 minutes and I will then mark it against the sort of marking criteria, the rubric uh, for the assignment and you will then have a good idea what you need to do to make it really great. And then if, it's, if we do the feedback that, that session in week 11, I might pull it forward a bit, uh, then you will have four, roughly four weeks to bring it up to scratch before you finally submit it. Uh, if we do it then, um, it would be the first week, uh, or second week after Easter that we do it during the first exam week. And you'll just come through my office for, again, 10, 15 minutes, and I will mark it there and then and you'll get the grade at that point. But I haven't finalised exactly when I'm going to do this, what I'll do it is about week 9, which means you then see me in week 12. We'll have to sort that out very quickly. I'll let you know by next week exactly what the arrangements are. Now the point about this, and then you guys having four, roughly four weeks to improve it, is the what I, we call learning analytics, shows that this is worth this sort of formative review followed two, three, four weeks later, about four weeks later, by the final review, is worth 15 to 20 percentage points on your final grade. So the grades you get, particularly on my modules, are pretty high. Something like 80, 85% of all of you will get a should get above 70%. And those same learning analytics should demonstrate also that those grades are not challenged by external examiner, examiners. They will not be scaled back because the criteria are such that uh, it supports that sort of level of achievement. And this review process and correction and improvement, again, delivers that amazingly high score. So engage with me, come to all of the sessions, and you will do well. That's the message. Do not skip any of the sessions, whether the seminar or the workshop. Because during the workshop that follows this session, you know, we've got an hour doing a seminar, which is when I, in future, will be, to, uh, in future day, weeks, We'll be giving you a, a bit of an introduction to context and giving you some research challenges. That will be the seminar. The one-hour session is you know, developing your ideas, finding evidence about those frameworks, those new ideas. And then in the workshop, once I've learned, launched the, uh, formally launched the assignment in about week three, then the workshop is where you will put that, those new ideas into practice in developing your assignment and I will be with you guys to answer your question, to address the questions you want to pose to me. And I'll be helping you to develop those, uh, your analysis, your ideas, help you to choose a good service. Um, so there'll be a lot of one-to-one -one work uh, with you guys over the next 12 weeks. There's one week when I won't be here, and that is November the well, about 7th or 8th, I think, the, fri the, la the Friday of the first week of November, I forget what the date is, when I shan't be here and you will just sort of work from either video from last year that's re relevant or um, you know, you'll be in here, someone might be here to, super uh, to sort of look after you or maybe it's just you know, private research and development of that week's topic. The reason is I've been invited by, or yeah, invited by a company called Informa to go to a conference in uh, California to actually make a presentation on governance and in relation to location services and, and so on. 
based actually on the work that my students did, who I supervised last year on their, their project. So again, as you look forward into two or three years' time, some of the work you do will get, I, if you do my projects, then you get published, you get mentioned out in these conferences. One of the pages will always, if it's based on the project, always has a list of the names of students who contributed their data and their analysis. So there's one group of about, there's about eight or nine students who I supervised last year whose names are flashing around the world now as contributors to some of the work that I've been doing. Three of them were co-authors of a, a paper that we wrote and present, I presented in SAS Global Forum last year, back in April, I think it was. And you can see uh, the paper um, off my website, and you can see what was actually uh, set up there. You can actually end up with the um, a video of it because I forgot to have a video camera with me. But you know, a lot of this work will get your name out there which is kind of helpful for you, I guess. So today is going to be a little bit different from normal in that there's quite a, quite a few things that I want you to go through in the week one. You look at the module introduction. you at this little item it was produced a few years ago by an HND student or business student who I was teaching um, I guess it must be about five years ago and he worked out how you could actually find publication dates or copyright dates publication dates of items on the web using Google in a rather nifty fashion uh, to find out when it was actually posted even if there wasn't a date visible on the web page or any other way <coughs> um, this shows you how so that you can actually get the year of publication for a random web page that doesn't have a date on it, um, and you can actually find it so you've got your Harvard reference properly there with a year, rather than doing n.d. no date. So that's one way of doing it. I've got to check this, that one there to make sure it's the right template uh, for you. You will be using, for your assignment, the Springer LNCS uh, document, the one you used last year for ICS, uh, for your assignment there. Richard, you don't look entirely <laughs> comfortable. Did I tell you the story about using templates uh, last year? Well, there's a couple of aspects about using formal templates for your writing and why I'm insistent on you doing it. One of the things is it allows me to, with justification, assign 20% of the mark for your assignment based on presentation and following the uh, template perfectly as an employability aspect. Because you're going to use templates in the future. I mean, my, I and my colleagues on the academic front, we possibly, if we submit two, three, four papers a year to conferences or to journals, every single submission will be on a different template. We just have to do it. If we don't properly follow the template, our submission will be rejected out of hand. So the first check is always, does it match the, uh, is it done in the template? Nope, reject. When you get to go to your placement job next year, many of you will find <coughs> there are templates that you have to use. If you don't use it, you'll be slapped over the wrist probably and told to go fix. Um, so, you know, getting used to using a range of different templates is just part of, you know, that's the way the world is. And there was a, a, one of your predecessors a couple of three years ago, a couple of years ago, when we were using a much more evil template than LNCS, it was the IEEE one, which is a really desperate template, very, very broken and so on. Much improved on the later versions of it, but that one we were using was really bad. And he was... This particular guy was bitching to his brother, who was a couple of years older than him, one day. And he was explaining why he was unhappy and so on, and came to use this beastly template. And so the brother said, sorry bro, you've got to deal with it. If, when you get outside of this place, you will have to follow templates. Period. 
And if you don't get do it right, your boss is going to reject it and send it back fixed. So, two aspects. It improves by learning to use these templates, finding the best way. I mean, sometimes the best way is not actually to create inside the template. But create it outside in a normal dot dot from you know, the ordinary template that comes with it, with Word that you use normally. Create it in there. Make sure you use the headers one, two, and three sort of constructs. And then when you want to put it into the template at the end, the one you want to submit with, you can prop the simplest is copy paste um, special uh, no formatting, but you could do it copy paste with, um, and convert the formatting to the destination. Um, and that kind of sometimes will work for parts of it. It'll, it'll take over the header one, two, and three. It might not do things usefully with parts of formatting parts of the um, other parts of the document, like the bibliography. But that's what's going to happen there. But I'll, I'll check that out for you. This section here is a reminder about Harvard's citing and referencing, and that's I, a little uh, presentation that, that you'll probably need to remind yourselves uh, what Harvard referencing is about and how to do it, citing and referencing. So there's some resources there for you to use to refer to. Um, you can always go back to uh, Plato to redo that second half, which is the citing and references section of it, because I guess you all know the uh, academic offence part of the plagiarism section of Plato. So use Plato if you need to, to develop your skills in the citing and referencing part, because you're going to need it now, that particularly now you've moved out of being working with the sort of rest of the computer science groups, you are going to be doing more and more report writing in with Harvard referencing. So you've got to get it perfect now, guys. It just saves so much effort if you can do it without thinking. <coughs> and when you get into some more complicated bits of referencing, like um, journal, uh, the journal articles from a, uh, a journal that comes out on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, or you've got a chapter from within an edited book where there's lots and lots of chapters there from different people, or you've got a conference pe paper from a conference. The thing to remember about which bit of the, of the various titles, because you've got the paper title or the paper ch the chapter title and the book t name title, or you've got the conference name or the journal name, remember that the thing that you highlight, whether bold or underscore or whatever, is the thing that's on the outside, it's the wrapper. The name of the journal, the name of the conference, or the name of the book, not the title of the chapter. It's that external thing. And that then says, oh, if I've got a video, what's on the outside of the video? It's that. If I've got an email, it's a title that's on the top. So the bold part of the all the things that you've got in a reference, a Harvard reference, the thing you put bold is the thing you might say is on the outside on the wrapper. Once you crack that, Harvard referencing becomes incredibly simple. Um, I'll, we'll have a little look at this top one here. I'm not going to go through everything on here, but I'll take you through some parts of the bits I think are most important. Today I'm not going to touch on the plagiarism side, but I will look at the ref briefly go to referencing and then a little bit about this thing which we call critical thinking, which I tried to introduce you to last year in ICS, and I'm going to be ramming down you as much as I can when I'm with you this <coughs> term, um, and then in your third year, the various modules that I teach uh, then. Uh, my colleagues will also be concentrating more and more on this critical thinking and critical analysis. So looking at quotations, hey guys, are you coming in for IT, uh, IT services? No, we need to use it for CGMA if that's okay. Pardon? Keep yourselves in the quiet corner and do not talk, please. So we've got a 
a group here that's they're busy. Now, quotation, citing, and referencing, why and what? One of the things that is, first of all, what is quoting? It is copying precisely what someone else has said or written. The most important thing you guys need to remember is that there is, in principle and in practice, almost no need whatsoever to copy and paste anything. I do not want to see a single quotation under most circumstances. A, it's lazy. B, I don't read it. I have mental snow paper for all quotation because they don't help. All a quotation proves is that you are able to find some words out there somewhere on the internet or in a journal or in a book. Great, so kids aged 10 or 11 are doing that today. You're not kids aged 10 or 11. I'm not interested in knowing that you can <coughs> find some specific <coughs> word and then pop it into your assignment. So what? What I'm interested in is what you do with it. So even if you feel it's really, really important to have a quotation because it says something so great, or it is so relevant, or it sets the scene, you've just used up 50, 100 words of your word count or your page length count. Because what's important is what you then write after it which is your justification or your analysis or whatever that says why those words are important and help to develop your analysis and your argument. In which case, take those 50 or 100 words of quotation out and just write that lot and put brackets, <coughs> blogs 2015, which tells me where to find it in principle. So you've justified, yes, I found this information here and this is my evaluation of it. I don't need to see the words there. I'll make this little point, yep. There are certain subjects, computing is not one of them, but literature, law are areas where the precise words probably should be quoted because they are a reminder to every, the people who are reading this particular analysis of what the words are. And you may be having in literature two pieces of of uh, text, exhibit A, exhibit B, to do that critical uh, liter literary comparison between the wording and structures and language in exhibit A vis-a-vis -vis exhibit B. You're not doing that normally in um, computing or informatics. There may be occasionally a need to quote directly if you've got some definitions which you're <coughs> going to then critically compare to lead to your chosen definition. You know, typically in the sort of things we're doing, there are 5, 10, 20 different sources of definitions of an IT service. And you might well want to go to various sources and see which ones are most interesting to you that lead you to this definition, the synthesis bringing together of these ideas from definition A, B, C to this is what I'm going to be really talking about in my assignment. So very occasionally you will need to put a short quotation, but not many. I'm not interested in that. And you have to think about, does your essay make sense, does your article make sense, your report make sense, if those quotations aren't there? The same goes actually for figures and tables of numbers and pretty pictures and so on. The thing you have to remember is you are doing the thinking, the analysis, and the writing. Your reader <coughs> should not be expected to have to think about these quotations or have to think about the, art, the figures and wavy lines and graphs and so on. You are telling the reader what to make of that picture or that table of data or that quotation. So does your essay make sense without a quotation? If it does, great. If it doesn't, 
then you need to think about changing the wording. Even if it's only a few words tucked in the middle of a sentence, make sure I can tell that there is that it is a quotation. If it's in a pa within a sentence, put quote marks around it and brackets, the source, the citation. If it's a bit longer, then you put it as an indented paragraph below or between your own writing, which is obviously full width, 